from Russia with Love is now 60 years old. And if ever a film could be said to have stood the test of time, the second Bond film is it. In part two, we start by looking at the villains. Robert Shaw. What an unbelievable performance, unbelievable villain. What, what I love is that he is very much Bond's equal, isn't he? Which is, this, you know, it's, with, with the second film in and we get that brilliant idea, you have someone who is Bond's equal, he's good looking, he's charming, he's incredibly physically fit, he's tough, he's a similar build to Connery, possibly slightly bigger than Connery. Uh, and you just, you, you, he's not your typical bad guy because he puts on this persona of being smooth and charming and everything. And I, I love it. And I mean, of course, it's, it's, it goes without saying that my favourite scenes in the film are when you just see him in the background. Connery's doing something in the foreground. And there you see Red Grant in the train already in the background. Or when they're at the gypsy uh, fight and he saves Bond's life. It's just such a lovely moment. He's just there in the background. Um, sort of shaping what goes on and it puts him in a control and you as an audience you can see stuff you know stuff that even bond your hero doesn't know you're in on it and he's not and you're waiting for bond to ca catch up with what's going on and that makes the whole build up so climatic i don't think the film uh, struggles after that I, I do feel with the living daylights which i, I love the living daylights but i feel like it it does feel a bit like they do a big spectacular ending and then they have to do another ending but this doesn't feel like that because for all the reasons Chris just gave, you've, you've had this brilliant build up, brilliant character. Finally, Bond gets the better of him in a brilliant scene, the way he gets the better of him. Because in, I think in films later, it'd be very easy for him to immediately do the briefcase trick on him. But you see Bond sort of in his mind fighting for his life and he's trying other things first. You know, the first thing he tries to do is wind Red Grant up to try and get him into a fight so that he can win. You can see him calling him names and it doesn't work. Then he tries to offer to buy him, you know, we'll pay you twice as much, it doesn't work. And you can see in his mind, the cog's wearing, what can I do? And then he has the briefcase idea and that pays off. And I love that, that it's not just a, an immediate thing, I'll get the gadget, that'll do it, which I think would happen a bit more in later films. Again, comes down to great patient filmmaking. And, uh, and yeah, Robert Shaw's performance is absolutely spot on. And yeah, in a shame, it's a sense that he dies because he just wanted to go on forever. But that is the beauty of their relationship and those scenes that they are captured and it's it's just wonderful. And I think the film keeps up a great pace afterwards because they have saved the big spectacle of that helicopter chase with some terrific stunts, how close that copter comes flying into to the, the stuntman playing um, playing Connery. Um, but they do that scene so well, as Chris says, you get the gadget, you get all those things you want to see. Um, so I don't think the film loses anything at all, but I do think that is an, an absolute, I think Cubby Brocky used to call them a bump in the film, the, the bits that people wait for. It's a big bump in the film. It's terrific. And of course, he's fairly, he's presented as almost like an archetypal henchman to start with. You don't hear much of him speak, do you, if anything. And then in the train, so much dialogue. He's not just a henchman, he's so witty. I think that's done for a reason. I think they wanted yeah. you to draw an assumption of what he was going to be like, and then they turn it on its head when you actually hear from him on the train, which is another, what a clever, clever idea. Brilliant. The dining scene, absolutely magnificent. People say the train sequence, oh, the fight. Yeah, of course, but before that. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. It's sort of great detective work again from Bond. It's not the audience won't be able to keep, unless you're a proper connoisseur. Yeah. They're not keeping up with Bond. Bond's already figured it out. I have the grilled soul. And for Madam. What about you, Nash? Yes, it sounds very nice. Make that three of those, will you? Oui, monsieur. I'll have a bottle of the Blanc de Blanc. Oui, monsieur. Make mine, Chianti. White Chianti, monsieur? Uh, no, the red kind. Well, enjoy your dinner, old man. I think I've got the answer to our problems. Very simple, really. Good. Bond is all, like you say, he's one step ahead, but we can, we've we got the foresight to see from a different perspective, which also gives us the advantage as well. I enjoy that scene immensely from the second they board the train to when they depart. I love the entire sequence, not just the fight sequence. The th interesting thing is, I think when Grant eventually meets his demise, there's definitely a momentum shift in terms of plot pace and where the film heads in what direction. But the, the bit that really sort of changed direction for me is when actually Bond goes in and he obviously finds... Okay. Yeah. Pim and Bay has been murdered along with the other henchmen. And that for me is a big shift in momentum because let's be honest, Kerim is one of his key allies throughout the entire film. 
And I actually feel his loss more than the loss of Red Grant, personally. Mm. But, um, but as regards to the fight scene itself, I mean, Ev, I think all the sentiments have been echoed perfectly here. Um, what gets me with that scene, though, is just how gratuitously violent that film is in that scene, which was a brave thing for 1963. You know, we hadn't really seen violence on that scale before, maybe slightly with Hitchcock and other similar filmmakers. But, you know, he garrots him, he stabs him yeah. violently in the arm. And, and it's also great from Connery's perspective, from Bond's perspective, because we see a vulnerability of Bond that we hadn't yet seen up to that point. There's that scene when he's on his knees and he's trembling with fear almost. And that is actually wonderful to see and incredibly well acted by Connery. I mean, people don't give Connery his dues sometimes. They think he's very much a one trick pony. You know, he just plays Connery in these different films. But there's a massive sense of vulnerability there, which makes for wonderful storytelling. And like Chris said, you know, when we eventually get to obviously the helicopter chase, that's for me the most iconic scene of that film. Mm. And uh, it's the scene I think that most people remember. Um, certainly at some point we'll have to make the pilgrimage up to Scotland to <laughs> yeah. in many ways, I'm sure. It does look but, like Scotland, doesn't it? That's the only thing. It, it doesn't really look like yeah, someone off the train it, off the Morning Express. But... It, it does, it does. And the thing that no one's mentioned yet is the uh, dispute over Ian Fleming. And is it Ian Fleming who's standing by the train? Because people oh, yeah. say, some people say no. I would <laughs> like to think it is, but he doesn't bear a striking resemblance, does he, to the uh, to the main man? This fight scene, I know we've we've talked about it endlessly, but it's just, it, uh, what, yeah. You sort of think it's the second film. Why have we not had anything as good as it since? You could say, couldn't you? We've had some great fights in the Bond series, some well, incredible fights, but nothing can live up to the originality and just hearing Kieran, Steve, and 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 Chris as well talking about the train scene. And my legs are like. My knee is shaking with excitement just thinking about how darned good it is. I mean, I knew it was good before this chat, and I've probably talked about... I've gone through this process probably before, but just talking about it is just so unbelievable. And I think what Steve said has made me may, maybe understand a little bit why even more, that idea that he he doesn't go straight to the gadget. And that might answer your question in terms of why they've not managed to reach this peak since but i can't think of a sequence that builds as well as this and delivers as well as this like chris said as soon as they're on the train or maybe it's kieran yeah as soon as they're on the train this is every scene the the meals the stuff in the cabin meeting grant that idea of him talking and playing with your expectations of what he was going to be like you learn so much about him you, just in that alone but still, the more that you learn about him, you think, how is this going to end? This is two repellent forces coming together closer and closer, and it's going to be explosive. And you can just feel like the aggression, the testosterone, the sweat, the one-upmanship, the intelligence even. You can feel, you know, two brains coming together. Red wine with fish. Well, that should have told me something. You may know the right wines. The other one on your knees. How does it feel, old man? And it ends in the most unbelievably intense fight where they're both going at it and it's not quick. None of it's quick from the moment they're face to face in the cabin, you know, at gunpoint, lowering the guns, trying to buy each other. You know, they are face to face. They know that in that cabin, they're going to have to face off. And like Steve said, Bond tries one thing, he tries the next. How is, and eventually it's just sheer physical brute force where they have to lunge at each other. And, and then the fact that the fight goes on for pretty long, it's not short lived. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had other train fights, which are absolutely brilliant in the series. I think pretty, we can pretty much say every train fight in the series has been magnificent, actually. You know, Teehee, Jaws, the one inspector. Um, I'm, I don't know if I'm missing another. Um, but they're all great and I enjoy all those. But this, it goes on. It's like it's so unbelievably intense between two really intense characters. And there's obviously no score. And um, there's just the sound of every punch, every bit of furniture ripping. And I think Spectre tried to sort of uh, do lots of nods and pay homage to it with their train fight scene. But 
Well, so what Spectre did was it they kind of did what a lot of action movies do now, where bodies seem to blast through whole pieces of furniture and break down a whole cupboard and go through walls and into the next room. A lot of action films now like to push each other through a wall and into the next room and then push through each other through another wall into the next room and it keeps going like that. But this, the fights smack off the furniture, but then they rebound and they clash and, and it's not tearing down the cabin. It's the cabins, you know, fighting back and there's, there's it's, it's in, just incredible. And the way that it, it comes to an end as well and not forgetting the lighting as well, you know, because because the lights go out, you just left these flashing lights, it's blue, it's nighttime, it's so unbelievably well done. And I think, whereas the rest of the film is kind of sometimes, you know, it's like a, a gorgeous slow wearing a suit through, a, you know, Istanbul, you know, you've got Terence Young, John Barry, Sean Connery in their element. This is them coming together in their element in a different way where there's just it's what a satisfying end to this to these two meeting it couldn't be better um just remarkable and just whilst we're on it i even though it's probably the peak of the film i still feel perfectly fine with what comes after it because it has to because I, I when i watch that i know that's not the end of the film i don't feel ah oh, mission complete because it's not that's not mission complete is it really um so there's no sense of me thinking it should have ended there or that should have been transferred to the end. It's, I think it's exactly right. And, you know, what a great way to tinker with the formula and things like that. It's, it's an incredible sequence on that train from everything, from the lighting to the sound, to the acting, to the choreography, to the effects. It's an absolute masterclass of filmmaking. Tell me, which lunatic asylum did they get you out of? My orders are to kill you and deliver the lector. How I do, it's my business. It'll be slow and painful. Because we had all the right surfaces, we had the right doors and the right, you know, we were banging this and banging that, aren't they? But I love that scene. And what was so nice for me was that there was no music. Mm. Oh, yes, much yeah, better without. Definitely. And because yeah. the bullet went through the glass, I was able to have my whistle of the train and the. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> It does work much better. I think fights, particularly yeah. unscored, you're really in. You feel the constraints of that small cabin, don't you, on the train? Yes. It just makes it so much more realistic. It I is think. a fantastic it scene, is. isn't it? Yeah. It's such yeah. a contrast to the Goldfinger one. Both equally brilliant. Yeah. yeah. But you, in from Russia with Love, you've got a very um, claustrophobic, frenetic fight, which is all sounds of that, you know, rushing yeah. winds and of the train and stuff. And then you've got an odd job, very slow, tense fight. Yeah. Two completely contrasting styles, oh, yeah. contrasting sounds, but both have that incredible tension in them. It's it's just brilliant. Oh. So yes. diverse. Yes, and, and you don't very often see two men in suits fighting no, each other. No, no. <laughs> not at all. It's quite a, quite a scene, uh, definitely quite a scene. You won't be needing this, old man. That's been Grant's method to kill people, and it's in such a brutal way, you know, fr from his kind of watch and then the thin wire. It's it's horrible. Um, 
so then but then the way that Bond gets the upper hand on him is just is uh, it's just so good. So for him to kill him that way is satisfying and a very clear ending to the um to the confrontation. Um so yeah, yeah, don't worry, I'm I'm absolutely on board with this. Um well, something I was also gonna mention about um sort of this scene and 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 everything we've got a long part of the film set on the train whereas you know lots of bond films starting with dr no he gets to the villain's lair and you know that's where it culminates and everything like that and we or it might be another location in the next one we've got fort knox this one isn't quite the same in that in that regard there isn't like a specific end place that that you know it's all gonna i mean that the train is the place where those two characters kind of you know face off but that's not how this film works um so yeah it's just it's really interesting and you know again i wonder whether it would ever happen again in a in a, in a bond film that they wouldn't you know there is there is pressure from people like us saying you know oh, you've got to have a clear set piece at the end which is in you know a specific location and to be fair they often do it they they do it well and they they try and stick to that, but that isn't here, um, and it's it's really interesting for that. Chris, your famous phrase, "Not an ounce of fat on it." And Terence <laughs> Young, Terence Young does deserve some credit. I mean, we can talk about a bit about him now if you want, because he's done four Bond films, and you know he he can stage a fight, he can stage mm -hmm. a grand scene, he can he can do the the talking scenes, he can you know he can do a Bond film basically. Yeah. No, I think I think that that yeah, like like Harry's saying is that it's almost like this, you know, apex of these filmmakers. You know, whether it's music, whether it's production, whether it's editing, all all coming together, but but being kind of like slave to the story. You know, they've not no one has like said, well, actually, we'll just this set piece will just like keep everyone entertained. No, we've not forgotten about the plot here. And like saying that that once you get on the train, not only do we have um, the, the 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 sort of coming, the, the conflict, the resolution of the conflict, but it's done in very different ways. Like you say that, that we get this is the first time we actually get to really get to know Red Grant. We get to meet him, hear him actually speak, and you know, and 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 reveal himself as a character who is really interesting. You know, I think every time I watch it, I think he's what, such a fascinating character to, to the point where. The, the, you know, for him, he is the, there's there's a whole subtext. Well, maybe not not even subtext of 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 um uh, of the class system about you know that Bond is the eaten and he is you know working class and that he is has a very different background to Bond about the fact that that Bond then tries to bribe him with you know the 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 the, the gold in the suitcase. There's the there's this whole back and forth. The fact that obviously that Bond, you know, that, that Grant reveals himself as being, you know, maybe or not maybe not uncouth, but you know, <laughs> choosing yeah, the us. right, the wrong wine with the meal, which is obviously very famous. All that sort of stuff. It is so it is so well written in terms of it's not it's not just like you were saying before in in some Bond films, it is just two characters come together and and having a, basically having a fight. There's much more to it in this film. It is. It, it, there's there's the stuff about, like, say, stuff about class and about you know the fact he calls him old man all the time. The, 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 there's this aggressive, you know, the, the the tension between them is 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 palpable, and and, and I think that it, it is so fascinating to watch it. And also that, that the fact that you are on a train that is speeding in one direction, that you've got this tick, almost ticking clock of we've got to make to this place, we've got to do this. It is. Like I say, it is. I suppose, like I say, you know, cliched. It's Hitchcockian in its design, but it's almost more than that. It's almost better than that because you've got these brilliant set pieces. You, you were holding together plot, character. I think I, honestly, I think I think what you know what Terence Young does with this film is it, it, it is a it is a you know I have to throw that word around. But it is a masterpiece because it is it is drawing together the talents of so many different people and not forgetting that at the end of the day, this is about, about a really tight story and a, a really tight plot. And also that you get to, to set pieces which are just brilliantly constructed. 
And that's what I said about the the, the fight. That the, there's no fat on that that fight because there's n- there's nothing left to spur. It is this is the scene we are going to perform it brilliantly, and we're not going to let anything to to. It's just we execute it perfectly. And there are certain, even you know, in later Bond films, there are obviously scenes, and there's you know some Bond films that do exactly that. But it's so satisfying when, like, this is what we set out to achieve, and we have absolutely nailed it. And for this film, that scene is just a standout because it is like that fight is is brutal, and there's there's so much more to it than just two blokes fighting in a room. There's 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 the discussions beforehand. There's the you know the the unspoken stuff. There's the stuff that I say about class and 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 and, and age and all that stuff. It's so rich, and that's what every time I come back to it, I think what a wonderfully rich film this is, you know. And using the you know the source material, but building on it and 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 making it a cinematic thing. And I think, I, I, like I say, this film is just uh, brilliant. Brilliant. Red Grant's been there, literally in the shadows the whole time. Even I, I mean, I didn't pick up on all that as a kid, you know, that he was sort of protecting Bond at the gypsy camp and. And then the fact that, hang on, he's, he's got an English accent. This is terrifying. This is really scary. Like, he, he, could, be, he could be anyone. He could, he's like a defector as well. Really, 007? You want to know my thoughts on From Russia With Love on its anniversary? I'm Cam the Provocateur from the Spy Hearts podcast, and I'm very happy to express my adoration for 1963's From Russia With Love on its anniversary. What do I love about this movie? I think it's that when you look at the entirety of the Bond canon, this is the only one that really feels like a stripped-down spy thriller, like really kind of gets into the espionage of the story. Um, You can look at, say, like Casino Royale from 2006. There's kind of a romantic sweep to that one that just makes it feel a little bigger, a little more grand in scale. Uh, For Your Eyes Only has a little, you know, a few too many like Roger Moore kind of campy moments you know hockey player fights come on that doesn't feel like down and dirty espionage whereas from russia with love by sticking pretty true to the ian fleming text just manages to feel so immersive like when bond is hanging out with karen bay just you know wandering around istanbul snooping you're like kind of leaning in behind those two guys kind of soaking up the world that they inhabit like it is kind of a guided tour of what a you know, spy in a Cold War scenario in a fantastical situation might be like. Uh, It doesn't have that kind of like comic book feel that, say, Goldfinger Onwards has. And while I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of Dr. No, that one has a little more of an adventure vibe, a little bit of almost like the spy-fi kind of stuff going on, whereas that is not present in From Russia with Love. This movie has Alfred Hitchcock stuff all over it. And Bond, you know, the series typically likes to jump on trends This is the very first one where you really feel that because North by Northwest, 39 Steps, they feel like they are just all over the inspirations for this movie and it just works so perfectly. You know, when you're watching Bond battle that helicopter at the end, that is North by Northwest in the crop duster. You can look at all the stuff on the Orient Express that feels very North by Northwest. Stuff on the Scottish Highlands feels kind of 39 Steps. And Rosa Klebb kind of feels like an evil Hitchcock mom, right? Uh, all that stuff, you know, it's baked into the novel. So it's not like they just invented it to, you know, pay homage to Hitchcock. It's just like the staging of it feels so Hitchcockian. And this movie, I think what really grabs me about it is that because it is a little more lower stakes, it's about, you know, getting this, just this device, this MacGuffin. Um, it really is able to just kind of inhabit this spy world and give you like kind of grittier action. You know, you look at the big show-stopping fight, you know, in this movie. Like, the battle with Red Grant is considered one of the all-time great Bond action scenes. It's the best action scene in the entire movie. But it's just a fist fight. It's not Bond, you know, taking down 50 guys with a machine gun in a hollowed-out volcano lair. It is two guys. You understand the personal stakes of each person involved. And it's just a battle of the wills to the end. That's the sort of tension that this movie can really ratchet up when it wants to. And, you know, speaking of Red Grant, this movie is rife with great villains. Red Grant is kind of like the big primary physical adversary of the movie. But, you know, Rosa Klebb is a fantastic, fantastic mastermind character. And the scene she has with Tatiana, 
where she's like manipulating her. So creepy and effective. Um, even like minor characters, Kronstein, that guy is iconic. Just look at him. And the chess scene intro is fantastic. And then also, you know, you've got some great Blofeld moments. Um, just the entire kind of design of the, you know, Spectre world, including Spectre Island, which is maybe the silliest part of the movie, but I love it nonetheless. It all just kind of works. The one thing I have an issue with, with From Russia With Love is actually Tatiana. I don't fault the actress because I think, you know, if you've read the story, you know that that character pretty much transported over pretty much whole cloth from the book. But when you're playing kind of that naive, you're always kind of on the back foot. Whereas I look at, you know, Honey Rider, who is drawn into Bond's world, but feels like she can kind of hold her own, at least physically when they're in a survival situation. Or you look at Pussy Galore in the next movie, who's just like, you know, piss and vinegar and is someone who can, um, you know, really work into the action element very strong and feels like she's a real, like, mental equal with Bond. That's the sort of thing I like more, whereas Tatiana, she's very sweet and she is iconic. Like, when I think of the history of Bond girls, just, a, you know, the sight of Tatiana definitely sticks with you. But she just doesn't kind of have that interest level that I think some of the other ones do. But beyond that, like she fits into the story well, and this movie just carries you along. It's as like consistent and propulsive as you know the Orient Express. It just never stops barreling through. It is under two hours, and some of those Bond movies will get bloated later on. I'm talking about you, Thunderball, as much as I love you. Um, this one just feels like kind of the they haven't quite figured the franchise out. They know they have a great thing. The next movie is going to be the one that really solidifies the formula. But here they're experimenting, trying different things. It just happens. All of them kind of work, but that wasn't where the franchise was going. So it's kind of like this almost Elseworlds. Like, what if we just had Bond movies that were like this from that point forward, where they were kind of these more stripped down espionage stories? Could have been interesting, but I'm happy to have this one. So, you know, from Russia with love, you know, it's still getting love all these years, you know, since it's been released and will for many decades to come. Rosa Kleb, what an unbelievably fascinating character. You know, Grant was saying he's the main focus of the film. But when you look back, Kleb isn't it in actually she isn't in it as much as you think, maybe. She's obviously prominent at the beginning, coaxing Tatiana into the seducing of Bond and running the operation and everything. And that's a really interesting scene. And then of course. We don't see her an awful lot other than with Blofeld and then that famous end scene, which is Hitchcockian in a different sense, isn't it? It's proper psycho, but it's <laughs> absolutely terrifying. She's unnervingly unscrupulous. That's how I will describe it. We often think of later Bond films, the villains in the newer films, Electric King, being yep. massive twist. Whereas in this, you know, people forget, you know, the second ever Bond film, the lead villain... In that film, because what we were saying earlier, I think Blofeld is the overriding story arc villain. But of that film, for me, it's Rosa Clare. And, you know, played by a woman. And yep. forget that. You know, the Bond has been breaking stereotypes since its genesis. Um, it's very clever, actually, because she's slimy. She's uh, she's a snake, basically. And I just think her her motives are actually rather fascinating. She, she does come across, especially when it's almost like an interrogation. She's threatening. She, she's she's completely unnerving. And if I was in, you know, Tatiana's shoes, I'd, I'd be quaking in my boots. But um, but she's got that. I think it's a fascinating motive that she has. But then when they turn the tables and she's in Blofeld's office, she's then quaking in her boots because she thinks she's going to be bumped off. Um, I think she's got a very interesting dynamic, but I don't think it's actually explored as much as it could have been because you see her for parts and then she disappears. And then before we know it, she's got the confrontation with Bond and the next minute then she, she's she's off, off the table anyway. So it, it's an interesting character, but I think they could have done more with it. So I'll be interested to hear what the other guys think on that matter. A bit like Dario, but that, obviously that's done for a plot device that he's not in it so that he can't be discovered and sort of snitch on Bond to Sanchez. But you do, I, because we know the film so well, you, you, you're you not thinking, hang on, what's happened to that that terrifying woman I saw earlier? And then, oh, heck, that ending. Well, in that respect, it's a little bit like Winston Kidd, isn't it? The ending, yes, in terms yeah. of some terrifying characters that you just well, slightly put to the back of your mind, creep in again. It's like, oh, no. Like, 
I, th- I find her genuinely terrifying. Funnily enough, I saw just, you know, on social media, a, a lovely, like, um, behind-the-scenes photo of from Russia Love, and you see Lottie Lenny there with a lovely smile, looking really friendly, you know. Yeah. But when, when she is Cleb, she is absolutely terrifying. The glasses, her manner, and, you know, she intimidates everyone. Not just Bond, you've mentioned with Tatiana, but also even Grant, when she meets him. She, you know, she imposes herself on him um, in a very unpleasant way. And yeah, the this end fight is another good set piece in terms of obviously it's not a physical fight like Grant's, but this idea of a shoe that is another iconic thing that's gone down in history that everyone will remember. The style of the fight, I mean, part of me, I, it seems to come up in a lot of recordings how I muddle up all my childhood, but the decor of the set of the hotel room has those fairly unpleasant scary vibes of slight sort of faulty towers with the old women and kind of just you know sort of thin walls and the and you know murderer, wallpaper murderer. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's all a little bit linked even don't look now you know just these yeah. these ho- ho- those hotels in that era do scare me just a little bit yeah. and then for Cleb to arrive and you know she does a decent job of causing problems for Bond and Tatiana even the way she goes down and manners, it's unpleasant. You know, the groans, the noises she makes, the hair out of place. And yeah, her, 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 her physics, <laughs> her shoe as a weapon. Yeah, yeah. This is extremely memorable as well and unique and original. It's another thing. And and like Kieran said, you know, a female villain, she gets the final say, she gets the final showdown. And one of the co-writers was, of course, a woman, so, which is absolutely, you know, magnificent. With this second film, they've done some incredible things and achieved things that even now we're, we're trying to emulate, we're trying to go back and recreate. And there's just it's clearly something that worked so well when everyone came together on this project. Introducing, well, certainly a lesbian character mm-hmm. is quite a big thing, and she's so devoted to Spectre, isn't she? I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's something that always makes a great body, I think. Her making Tatiana uncomfortable doesn't mean that she is, you know, is that, that she's, you know, a lesbian herself. It, it's it is sort of playing into that. She is trying to, you know, have control over her. And the, the fact that she puts a hand on her and says, you know, you're a pretty girl and or whatever the line is, it is to make her feel uncomfortable and it is to hold power over. In the same way, and that's what makes it so progressive, is that that would perhaps would have been, you know, written for a man. That that, that actually the, the, the stereotype is that it's the man that's all like, oh, you're a pretty girl and, you know, you do the right thing and I'll, you know, I'll look after you types kind of sort of approach. Take off your jacket. Turn around. Hmm. You're a fine-looking girl. But I think that that what makes her refreshing is that, well, for for, for one, she isn't she isn't a zen she doesn't look like Zenya on a top. She isn't you know she does you know she is a middle-aged woman you know she looks and, and that is in itself does play into you know the the the, the sort of stereotypes of you know the witch and the scary older woman perfectly well but i think there is there, there is a slight knowingness about that, that that she was cast you know for the way that she was the way that she looked but also the fact that she is this sort of you know like avenging character like say that that her her appearing at the end is almost like a horror trope yeah. she's there you know you Oh, the plot is ended. The film has ended, and suddenly, you know, the hand comes out of the ground, you know, and grabs yeah. you by the ankle or something. And that's what she is. She, she, we're, we're, we're on hot, we're on honeymoon now, and here she she appears with her, you know, knife and a shoe, ready to attack you. And like you say, that, that and that's where you get that kind of like, tarot point about don't look now. I can yeah. I can totally see those kind of connections of this woman suddenly and again dressing as something that she's not. It is really quite kind of creepy. 
but I think she I think she's a brilliant villain and a brilliant character and 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 also like you say the fact that she is still you know the shoe you know it is so memorable you know the glasses and again the choice of glasses that someone sat I bet Terence Young, <laughs> Young went through about a tray of glasses and said no <laughs> these are the ones that you need to wear because they are like like the bottles of bottoms of coke bottles you know what I mean like the like three inches thick and <laughs> massive and it's just again like weirding you out and I think that that's 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 how she serves her purpose and also that I know, and I know it wasn't intentional but when she's on the ship with you know Blofeld that the fact that that shot where it gets rewound yeah. you did it in reverse it, again it makes it's like the end of Carrie which is the yeah. film in and then she, then did it in reverse and then played it the other way around just to make it kind of odd she is like a horror icon i think you know like talk about you know <laughs> you know nightmares about these you know the this the scary woman she absolutely plays into that and i think that that yeah I, I, what a brilliant character and and absolutely holds her own you know this i, I don't feel like she's underwritten I think she's not in it because there's no place for her. You know, she serves her purpose for the plot in terms of, you know, setting things up. She absolutely is. You, you feel that absolutely con sort of convinces Tatiana to do this thing. And to be honest with you, if she told me to do something, I probably would do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> she is quite threatening and overpowering. But yeah, I, yeah. The, the fact that she just reappears at the end, to me, isn't, it isn't an issue. It is the final skirt. It's the... Uh, let's say, the hand from the grave finale. <laughs> it is linked with Don't Know Now, Harry. I think, you know, the, the sort of like, <sighs> you know, the, those little women, and the, she told you, she told you, and that, oh, it's absolutely awful. And the, the sort of way she's like, ah, ah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so iconic, that shot, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It, and you know what's interesting? You know, we've talked about how good Connery is. Isn't it interesting that you you... you can see and feel that he'll hold his own against Grant because he's strong and he's physical, but you can also see and feel that he can be under threat by Cleb, as in outsmart, you know. Because I'm just thinking if you put Cleb against like Ethan Hunt, you know, in Mission Impossible, or against Daniel Craig as Bond now, you'd never quite, you'd always think, well, he could just batter her, kind of, you know, or that, you know, just easily, easily. But with Connery, he, I don't know. There's just this dynamic where he can be threatened. He can be put under pressure, and in she's unexpected like, scenarios. Yeah, she's like the scorpion. Isn't she? The fact that he has to get the chair to pin her against the wall because oh, she's yeah. like striking yeah. him all again yeah. and again. Like I say, it's it's not the threat is is her her the, how like aggressive she is and how she's just like for the cause. She's going to kill him. But also, yeah. it's that, that 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 shoe kicking out is just <laughs> it, it's terrifying. Having to pin her against the wall, it's yeah. Well, it's, it also gives Tatiana something to do as well. Yeah, yes, yeah. It's one of many Bond films. I think can't remember which one we discussed it in. It was probably in the Thunderball review, where Bond actually doesn't kill the main villain. You know, it's the character is more important than oh, we just want an end fight with Bond and whoever's the baddie. In this, it's. It works really well dramatically that Tatiana kills Cleb. This is classified far above his level. I will say nothing to if anyone. If you do, you will be shot. Come, come, my dear. You are very fortunate to have been chosen for such a simple, delightful duty. A real labour of love. Join us for part three of our 60th anniversary celebration of From Russia With Love.